The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. You may be surprised to learn that one of our most valuable crops is alfalfa. It's a component of the critically important forage industry, which provides feed for everything from livestock operations to pet stores. On today's Farm Connections, I travel to a dairy farm near Yoda, Minnesota, where I learn more about the forage industry and get to the root of alfalfa, a surprisingly powerful and useful crop. It's all coming up on Farm Connections. Welcome to Farm Connections with your host, Dan Hoffman. Farm Connections on KSMQ sponsored in part by the Cedars of Austin, a senior living community. We even have a retired farmers club. Independent, assisted, and memory care apartments. Learn more at cedarsofaustin.com. Will Mahler, the Ag Attorney, has been representing dairy farms in Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin for 37 years. Will Mahler, the Ag Attorney's office, is in Rochester, and Will is a proud partner of Farm Connections. Thanks, Will Mahler. There are four important outcomes of agriculture that provide our population's basic needs. Food, fuel, feed, and fiber. On today's Farm Connections, we're going to focus on feed the products that go into our livestock, which are then converted into dairy products or meat. I had the opportunity to visit Garland Dairy near Yoda, Minnesota, to get a first-hand explanation of why feed is so important to our food cycle. Let me introduce you to Dean Allen and Data Allen Tully, siblings and agriculturists, whose success in the dairy industry is based on their keen knowledge of feed and dairy science. Dana, the subject of our show today is concentrating on forages and how you use that forage to make ice cream cones and milk products. And you mentioned that pigs have one stomach or a simple stomach like me and ruminants are different. How do ruminants take grass and forage and alfalfa and make it into something as nice as an ice cream cone? Ruminants, cows, dairy cows like we have, um, they have four stomachs and the first one is a big fermentation vat basically and so in that they're able to break down forages and make them into nutrients that we would use into carbohydrates or into glucose into proteins and then they're able to go ahead and convert that into milk so the cows are unique more unique well Dean earlier said he's in charge of getting that alfalfa to the barn mm -hmm. and you're in charge of the cows what does in charge of the cows mean? I care for the cows every day with really, really great employees that we have. Um, we want the cows to be happy and healthy and providing high quality feeds at the right time, making sure that they have a nice place to lay, um, all helps to take care of the cows. But fiber is the foundation. If you have an upset stomach, you don't feel good. So healthy cows don't have upset stomachs. Can you mention some numbers about production with the cows? Our herd average is about 31,000, um, just over 31,000. So that means in 305 days a cow produces 31,000 pounds of milk. Um, I think the state average is about 20. Um, let me think, 1,100 pounds of fat, 900 pounds of protein. Well, when you mentioned 31,000, that's a rolling herd average? Yeah. That's fabulous. That's yeah. wonderful. I can remember seeing records and data saying, boy, if we can just get to 10,000, 12,000, yep. 14. And that's a testimony to our farmers and the team that helped them mm -hmm. moving all the way to 31,000 on a consistent basis. That, that's fabulous. It, it's the quality of the forage, but it's the quality of the animal and the quality of the care they're getting, right? Yes. Yep. So when you're, you're your milk is harvested. We're going we're gonna to take a look at that in the milking parlor, but where does it go? Uh, our milk is directly loaded onto semi-tankers, so we cool it, and then it's loaded onto semi-tankers and taken up to be processed into cheese. So how do you monitor the cow care and comfort? Um, actually, uh, we milk three times a day through a, a 
50 stall rotary parlor. And every time the cow goes to the milking parlor, we retrieve her milk information. So how many pounds of milk she gave that day on that shift. And then we use computer systems to go ahead and look at each cow. Each day we come out and check any cow who may have um, deviated or, or decreased milk production compared to the day before or the week average. So it's an everyday process that we're out walking the barns, looking at cows, making sure that they feel okay and that they're taken care of. But it sounds like you do monitor the forage and the feeds going in. Tell us about that process. We use a computerized feeding system. We have computers that are in the feed trucks and pull up how many pounds of each ingredient to add and then it's all mixed in a big mixer and delivered to the cows. When you talked about the ration being mixed, is that the TMR, total mixed ration? Yes. And that large truck that we see come through feeding your cows, that's a TMR on, on yep. a truck? Yep. So what's in that? And we'll look at that some, but what's in that big tub? Well, 50% of it is forages, alfalfa hay, put up as haylage, corn silage, then we have some corn, we have soybean meal, canola meal, cotton seed, corn gluten feed, and they all get their minerals and vitamins every day. They're getting better care than some people. This is amazing. And it goes back to Dean on the machinery and mm -hmm. harvesting that forage crop and going out to the field to harvest sunshine and nutrients from the soil. Is that a year-long process or do you only work maybe one month out of the year? How's that uh -huh. work? We're, we're usually trying to get four crops of alfalfa in in a year. Um, this year being a little bit delayed, we usually start end of May and then we will cut every 21 to 23 days after our first cutting for the quality that we want in our forages. And we will do that in about a week's time. If weather permitting. A week's time being from cutting to actual harvest? cutting to tarping the piles. Dean, do you pack the piles of alfalfa and silage? Yes, as we're bringing it in, we bring it in with uh, tandem trucks and then it's dumped and then I push, push it into a pile and we're packing it. Uh, we'll use two to three tractors on the pile to make sure that it's packed as tight as we possibly can get it. Uh, as soon as we're done with the crop, then we are tarping it and we'll use two layers of plastic on and then we'll put um, recycled semi sidewall tires on the plastic so that no air gets into the forage so that we can get the best product possible to the cows for Dana. So the packing removes that oxygen out of right. the stack and out of the feed product. Why is that important? Um, that's to help so that there's correct fermentation in the forage if you get too much oxygen or any oxygen in there, then you're going to start having molds created and other toxins. Toxins. That would be a good word. Spoilage. To spoilage. So the tighter we can pack it, the less spoilage we got, which means the less waste uh, of feed, so that uh, again we can get the best quality product to the cows. So you're always talking about quality, all the way from preparing the soils, planting the seeds, harvesting the seed, and you talked about harvesting at the right time to get the quality. What's the right time to cut alfalfa? Um, basically, it's when my nutritionist feels that it's the right time to cut, um, or the agronomist, uh, and that's based on what kind of quality my sister wants for her forages. That's when we asked Dana, what, what kind of quality are you expecting from your brother Dean? Well, we want to be able to cut alfalfa when it's high in protein um, and when the stem is digestible because the digestibility equals energy. So as the rumen works and the bugs break down the, the stem, that's where our energy comes from. The leaves are the protein, the stem's the energy, and so it keeps a healthy rumen keeps a productive cow. But I'm guessing you also maybe do some scientific tests of those of those forages? Yeah, everything is tested. Um, it's tested as it goes in for dry matter or moisture. And it's tested um, three weeks after it's in the pile, after it's been covered to determine 
fermentation profile to make sure it's a quality um, product, as well as the nutrient profile. So how digestible are, are the stems? How much protein did we have in the leaves? And then we're able to take those components and put it with other ingredients in their diet mm -hmm. to give them a complete diet. Dana, do you involve the nutritionist and the veterinarian in the herd health process, or is it totally you that determines what happens with the cows? No, um, it's a whole team of us. You know, our nutritionist is is here often, <laughs> um, so it's his advice, things that he sees on other farms, um, and our veterinarian. We have a great relationship with our veterinarian, and I would venture to guess I talk to him almost every day just to get another set of eyes. How are the cows doing? How, how do they look? Do you see any changes? Are you seeing something different than what we do? So, and on top of that, we have a great staff. I mean, we have some real veterans that um, we wouldn't be successful without them. And so their trained set of eyes are looking at the cows every day as well. You've done a great job. As they look at the cows, their, the herd health looks great. Hoofs, utter health, hair coat. I mean, you have a lot of reasons to be proud. We're going to look a little more around the farm, but thank you so much for your time, Dana. We really appreciate it. Dean, thank you very much. The success of Garland Dairy is impacted by the quality of alfalfa they're able to produce for their herd. And that begins right here in the field. I was joined by University of Minnesota scientist Dr. Michael Russell and graduate student Matt Yost, who explained the unique and powerful qualities of alfalfa, a crop you don't want to take for granted. Michael, where do you work and what do you do? Well, I work for the U.S. Department of Agriculture and in a segment called the Agricultural Research Service. It's a group of a couple thousand scientists that work on all kinds of problems in American agriculture, including human nutrition. I work at St. Paul campus of the University of Minnesota. That's where several federal research scientists are located. Matt, how do you fit into this? Well, I'm uh, currently a PhD student at the University of Minnesota, and I work with Dr. Michael Russell and also Dr. Jeff Coulter, mm -hmm. who's an extension corn agronomist. And so as a team, we have done research uh, on alfalfa corn rotations, and we've also done a lot of extension on alfalfa corn research in the state. In the past three years, we've, we've conducted experiments on about 42 farms. And so we've had the opportunity to interact with farmers, uh, to do research with them, and then to present and, and share our results with them. Tell us about soil health. Tell us about the plant. Why is it important to, to grow alfalfa? Well, alfalfa is a perennial, which is really quite different than most of the crops we grow. It grows over several years. And because of that, it leaves the soil undisturbed by tillage. That allows soil microorganisms to help build uh, the aggregates for water and, and air holding capacity. And, uh, and also allows the farmer to amortize the costs of planting it in the first place over several years, which is a great economic boon. Uh, it, in fact, alfalfa, it turns out, is, has been for over several decades the most valuable crop a farmer can grow in Minnesota in the south, east and southwestern business service uh, evaluations. Uh, it is a deeply rooted crop, and so like corn, it can grow four or six feet in a year, but corn only gets one shot at it, and then it dies. Uh, alfalfa will grow four to six feet every year it's in the field. And so, for example, there's a single alfalfa plant, and this was grown in the greenhouse, but it indicates, Matt, maybe you can help me on this, it indicates what a typical two and a half year old alfalfa plant might look like underground. We don't usually see this, but the perennial crop puts a lot of, of, of its resources into growing these roots. Why would it do this? Well, it's a prairie plant, essentially, and all of our prairie species, or most of them, do exactly the same thing, and they have several years to grow the roots. These roots, the fine ones, break down, provide nitrogen into the soil. The large roots provide holes for the roots of the following crops to grow into and they also add a lot of carbon to the soil. So it's really uh, immensely valuable to have this deeply rooted perennial forage in our cropping system. So it's great for the crop, it's providing mm -hmm. its own nitrogen source and mm -hmm. it's taking it from the air. 
What does it do to the soil? Is there some of that that stays as a residual for the next crop? Well, you bet. Um, we, th we know from measuring root turnover, the, the disappearance of the fine roots, that even in the top foot of soil, about 60 pounds of nitrogen is released by just the death of new roots every year. And uh, Matt can talk about this later, but that buildup of nitrogen then provides nitrogen for the subsequent crop, so the farmer doesn't have to put as much fertilizer on. A natural source. A natural source, yeah. Matt, fill us in. Yeah, it's, um, for the last four years, uh, I've, I've conducted research to try, and, to try and determine how much nitrogen alfalfa does provide to the soil and, and to a following corn crop. And so, for the last almost 50 years, researchers have, have tried to answer this question. How much nitrogen fertilizer do we need to put on corn that follows alfalfa in rotation? And 50 years ago, researchers found that sometimes we don't need to put any nitrogen fertilizer on corn following alfalfa, meaning a big savings for farmers, a lot less fertilizer they would need to apply to the corn. But there was times that it did need nitrogen fertilizer, and we really couldn't identify when those times were. And so recently what we've done is we've, we've collected all of the the literature, all the studies that have been conducted on, on nitrogen benefits of alfalfa to corn. And what we found is, is that we can predict it um, quite well actually. We've, we've looked at how the alfalfa was managed, how long they keep the alfalfa um, growing, how much alfalfa is there, um, weather conditions and um, tillage conditions when they kill the alfalfa and how it's killed, um, we found that those, those things affect, affect when the corn after alfalfa needs nitrogen fertilizer. And we've worked on developing models that will actually predict that. And with uh, quite high accuracy, 80 or 90% of the time, we can now predict which fields of corn following alfalfa will need nitrogen fertilizer to increase the corn yield. And so it's, um, this research is exciting, it's, it's been, um, a great opportunity. We've worked with many farmers to, to look at these management factors and now we think we've developed uh, recommendations that are much improved over what we've used for the past past 50 years. I just, uh, he might be being a little humble about this. It's, it's a major breakthrough. It's a much more site-specific approach to, uh, to helping the farmer manage nitrogen, keeping it out of the water and out of the atmosphere. Michael, you've spent a lot of time talking about soil structure and root systems. Why is that important, this huge root? We have a problem here in Minnesota with nitrate getting into groundwater. And nitrate moves through the soil because there's too much there and whenever water moves. Because alfalfa is present in these fields, it's absorbing water and reducing the flow of the nitrate. And alfalfa, like any plant, can take up the nitrate, just like corn could or soybean or any other crop or any other plant. And so, and it's a protein crop. We're harvesting protein here on these acres. So it's about 20% protein and about a sixth of that is nitrogen. And so it'll take up nitrogen from the soil and scrub it clean. We were asked to come in on a, on a train derailment site in North Dakota a few years ago where a fertilizer cars had spilled fertilizer and contaminated the water there. And they had tried for seven years to clean up the site. They excavated soil, they pumped water, they planted wheat and other crops, and they just couldn't do it. Well, we took alfalfa over there and planted it, and in two years the site was clean and released to the, for other use. Because it has such a hunger, it can take up 200 to 400 pounds of nitrogen a year, that's far more than corn will take up, and uh, so it can help clean, keep the environment clean. And even when you don't have a spill, it's protecting our groundwater. On tile drain soils, those are soils that need these subsurface Whole, uh, pipes that help it drain so farmers can farm the land, that water goes into surface water. The same thing happens with alfalfa there. It keeps that nitrate out of the water, keeps our rivers and lakes a lot cleaner. As I hear you talk about prairie type plants mm -hmm. and the fibrous root system going back, going down several feet, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about erosion and other things. Can you elaborate on that? Well, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, perennials, we know the grasses, for example, really hold the soil in place on slopes and for conservation reserve plantings where farmers are actually paid to, to take land out of production to keep it in place, they plant grasses primarily on that. 
Alfalfa isn't a grass, it has a different root system, but it is a perennial, and so when it's in place on the landscape like this, it, help, it will help hold the soil in place likewise. This year we had probably a, over, well, over one million acres of winter-killed alfalfa. That still, because that, those roots are still present in the surface, will prevent erosion this spring, or reduce it at least, compared to fields that are tilled. And uh, so that's a major benefit for the public. We have less sediment in the ditches, we have less sediment in the rivers, uh, and it also reduces nutrient loss. Fascinating things. Yeah. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's turn our attention to the forage industry as a whole. Chelsea Russell of the Midwest Forage Association met up with me near Yoda to tell me how her organization is working to support farmers and grow alfalfa and other forage crops. Chelsea, here we are in the beautiful outdoors in an alfalfa field, and that's some of what you do for work. Tell us about the MFA. Well, thank you for having us out here, Dan. It's a good opportunity. MFA is the Midwest Forage Association. Um, Forages, in particular alfalfa, are very key to agriculture sustainability um, and also drive rural economies. So alfalfa is good for wildlife habitat, it's good for nitrogen fixation, it's great for crop rotations. Um, but all of those benefits, farmers do need to have it be uh, economically valuable to them. So MFA helps them create value. We do that through leadership, we do it through education, promotion, advocacy. Um, that's really what we're all about. Well, we're in southern Minnesota. Where else is alfalfa grown? Alfalfa is grown throughout the country, uh, many different places in the world. If you look at NAS data, um, alfalfa is the fourth most valuable crop in the country. It's just behind uh, corn, soybeans, and wheat. It's actually Minnesota's fourth most valuable crop, too. Um, it, it, it's very versatile. It can be grown in all kinds of different environments. It's grown, there's acres throughout the whole country. Uh, if you look at that map where NAS uh, puts where all the values are, alfalfa is the fourth most valuable crop in all of the state or all of the country except for the southeast. And why is it grown in the Midwest? It's grown in the Midwest. Um, a lot of it is for dairies. It's got, we, got, we have good growing conditions for it, and we also have a lot of cattle, um, a lot of dairies around here. Dairies and cattle are the number one consumers of alfalfa. Chelsea, once the alfalfa is grown, produced, harvested, what happens to it next? Where does it go? Um, well, like I said, beef and dairy cattle are the number one users of alfalfa. Uh, since dairy cows use so much of it, we can actually say that this here, the alfalfa, is actually ice cream in the making. Um, but it's used from small to large animals. Gerbils will eat it, horses, sheep, um, even maybe that elephant you've been visiting at the zoo is going to be eating alfalfa. Uh, something that you might not know is that they say that because alfalfa fields are such a good source of nectar, that one third of our country's honey is actually from alfalfa. Oh, that's fascinating. So there's many uses beyond just feeding it to dairy cattle and beef cattle. Tell me more about MFA and the research and the things that you do to help producers. MFA is very committed to research. Um, on one level, we are affiliated with the National Fall Fund Forage Alliance. So we have been able to send members from MFA with them each year to the NAFA DC fly-in, where they will get to meet with uh, their Congress members and different agencies. Um, one thing that we're really pushing for is to have the alfalfa forage and research program funded. Um, there's a great disparity between the public research that's being done on things like corn and alfalfa, or I'm sorry, corn and wheat and cotton. They have 10 times the funds that alfalfa has. If you look at USDA um, expenditures, we actually have less than apples or tomatoes. And like I said, less than 10% of what the bigger crops have compared to, we're the fourth most valuable, so we think we should be comparable to the rest of them. Why is that important? What would you do with those dollars? Um, well, research is very important um, across, there's all kinds of different things. So drought has been a big issue. Uh, winter kill has been a big issue. We don't have a lot of people working on those just because we have so few scientists and so few dollars going around. So all kinds of things to make alfalfa yield um, 
more so the farmers can use it better. It has to keep up with the corn uh, yields and the soybean yields. We do have the Midwest Forage Research Program. Um, MFA started that to address some of the immediate needs since we weren't getting what we needed uh, from other public funds. Mm -hmm. We've given out just under $100,000, which if you consider we don't have a check off, that's pretty impressive. It all comes from um, voluntary dues and donations. Fantastic work, it must be gratifying for you as well. It is, I really like getting out here and the farmers are great to work with when you get to sit down and help them um, put together. They, they have a whole bunch of ideas they wanna see implemented. They're also extremely busy out here. You're gonna see there's a whole bunch of stuff going on on farms like these. So they need people like us to step back and help them with the education and the research aspects. So your association really promotes the producers needs and goals. Yep, we do. We uh, try to listen to our producers the best we can and say, what do you guys need? What, what improvements could be made or what kind of research should be done? And then we try to get that research done and then we try to bring it to them through Forge Focus magazine or different events or newsletters. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing. I really yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. On today's episode, we took a close look at the forage industry, a sector of our ag economy that can't be underestimated. I learned a lot about the importance of feed in our food cycle and how truly unique and powerful alfalfa is. I'll never look at alfalfa in the same way again. I hope you learned something too. Please join me next time on Farm Connections.